Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on ThinkTech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. Today, we're looking at Indigenous Innocence Until Proving Guilty, Article 11, Justice Not Jail. Everyone charged with a penal offense has the right to be presumed innocent until proved guilty, according to law in a public trial, at which one has had all the guarantees necessary for one's defense. No one should be held guilty of any penal offense on account of any act or omission which does not constitute a penal offense under national and international law. Unfortunately, what we see happening today in the Mekong Delta region of Vietnam shows that it's actually a crime to be born indigenous. Today, we're joined by amazing advocates and activists during the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues to share the current conditions of what people across the spectrum fighting for social justice are facing in the Mekong Delta. Moni, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Moni, can you share with us what first inspired you to care about this issue and what's happening to monks today in Kampuchea Kram? Yeah, in uh, my previous uh, 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 UNPFA, right, uh, in 2013, uh, there was a command from Buddhist monk who was arrested and then um, put in the, uh, the, the, the bag and then, you know, put it uh, the carry to the, the police station. And then for and then they also arrest and defraud uh, two uh, Bud, uh, Buddhist monks in that time. And now uh, this month in March two thousand twenty four, they did come to our temple uh, and then arrest and defraud our five Buddhist monks this time. So five Buddhist monks were arrested and defrocked. For doing what, Moni? What was the crime that they, uh, what the government tried to accuse this because, uh, they violate the dem democratic freedom. And actually, they are not because they try to ar arrest and defraud the boot, the head monk of the, uh, the drum state temple while he was on the way back to his temple. They actually kidnapped it, uh, with one of the background Buddhist followers. And that's on March 26th. And March 28, they came to the temple and arrest four more Buddhist monks and one Buddhist follower. So basically, people are being arrested for the praying is a penalty and a crime under the law these days for people just practicing their basic religious freedoms. Yes, because they said that because when they arrest our Buddhist monk, they accuse a different crime, right? So basically, the the, the our people. Our Buddhist monks, he just want to our people practice our religion in our indigenous way, and then we don't want to be controlled by the Vietnam Buddhist Sangha, and because of that, the government doesn't like it, and then they try to frame and arrest them and frame them for a different crime, and they say because he share what it, uh, the government has done to the temple, and because he shared the truth, and the government accused him uh, abuse that democratic freedom. Yeah. So that's what has happened to five people. What is the current state? What are the names and what is the current state of the case regarding their um, important human rights violations that they're facing? So right now they uh, being uh, arrested and detained and facing for uh, the sentence, right? And with that crime, they can face from three, uh, from six months to three and a half years. Yeah. So right now they, they, they are being detained. Thank you very much, Moni. So T, thank you so much for joining us. I was wondering if you might share with us, why is this issue so important in international human rights law? And why is it core and important to the international arena and how you've been involved in this important issue? Hi, uh, thank you, Joshua, Joshua, for giving you this opportunity to be here. So I think it's, uh, it's really important for us to be a voice for our people because with, we as we know from recent uh, crackdown against our people in the Mekong Delta, um, they don't really have a voice. And then they choose to stand up even through social media or try to exercise their right to be recognized or to even learn um, about the uh, the UN Declaration of Rights to Indigenous um, uh, people. They are being detained, defrauded, and imprisoned. And so the work we do is very crucial in helping to advocate and bring their voice to the United Nations and the international arena. And so I think for my, my personal journey, um, I started really kind of learning about who I was um, 
having been raised abroad, my parents were from the Mekong Delta and knowing um, my history um, and then having an opportunity to visit and then learning about the, mm -hmm. I think, I guess the rights that we have and opportunities that we have to make an impact. I just really wanted to make a difference. And so what we have here, um, our, I would say privileges in some ways, um, our right our freedom, the basic fundamental freedoms, and sometimes we don't really think about um, how people don't have it. And so how can we um, kind of bring that to them so they can enjoy the rights that we have here? Um, in some ways, we kind of, our parents left because it, they didn't have that, right? But in another way, we are, you know, having given this big honor and privilege to give back to a community and uh, allow them to live uh, with dignity, uh, with opportunity, with peace, you know, and um, and be able to foster as any other as, as any other peoples on on this planet. Um, so yes, powerful statement, and really appreciate you sharing those aspects because it really talks about how the diaspora becomes democracy defenders and stands up for what matters most. And more importantly, though, don't just forget your roots, where you came from, and know that since we have these basic human rights right, to freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, to use those powers to then make a difference on the ground and then utilize the global arena to make sure that the world doesn't forget what people are actually still facing around the world and why these human rights are so important. Connie, can you share with us a bit about what is the main issue to you in international human rights law and why it's so important for young people to be involved and make a difference? Yes, and so um, very good evening. Uh, the, how it impacts the youth is when we look to our elders, especially when it comes to our Buddhist monks, uh, the institutions, uh, our sacred temples and sacred sites are where we uh, disseminate knowledge to one another. So that is from the elders to our youths. And so when our elders are being uh, imprisoned, when they're being defrocked, when they're being um, framed as terrorists or uh, persons of political dissent, uh, the youth then will not have a means to uh, look to their elders and find ways to learn about their culture and continue the heritage and the values that uh, we hold so dear to us. And this is generations from generations. So uh, as of lately, or with the recent events, uh, with uh, many of our Buddhist monks being imprisoned, uh, well, fortunately, um, it is affecting a lot of the generation. And uh, we, as um, especially uh, for myself, as a person that represents the diaspora, uh, we are trying to find better ways to not only uh, respect the traditional values uh, and uphold them, but also find modern ways to also uh, make sure that we are going through the correct mechanisms, uh, especially in regards to um, human rights. Thank you so much, Connie, for sharing that perspective. And when you look at it, really, no one shall be held guilty of any penal offense on account of any act or omission, which does not constitute a penal offense under national or international law at the time when it was committed. And of course, that is definitely an example of what's happening today. And nor shall a heavy penalty be imposed than the one that was applicable at the time the penal offense was committed. And what we're looking at is not in any way an illegal act. It's actually exercising the basic rights under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which Soti was sharing about. It's specific articles that people are just actually organizing to make sure that their lives can be improved. Moni, can you share with me what first inspired you to care about this issue and some of the first campaigns you were involved when you were actually born there and then now are here? Can you share what first inspired you? Yeah, because, you know, I, when I was born there, right, like um, uh, as a Khmerkram growing up in the, uh, the the village, right, because as men, uh, we, uh, the temple is a place, not just a worship, but it's a place for us to learn about the culture, the language. And then, uh, you know, when I went out here and then we know that our Buddhist monk 
over there, they don't have a fundamental right just to practice the religion, right? For example, right now, we, the way we practice our religion under the control of the, the, the Vietnamese Buddhist Sangha is the Buddhist organization uh, created and uh, controlled by the government. So, and, and then because of that, and if you if you practice your religion under control of someone, that means you don't have the right to freely practice what you want, uh, the, the way we traditional uh, as a background used to practice, right? And then, and for now, the government even control like how to appoint the ab abbot of the, uh, the the Buddhist temple, or you know the, or what the language when used. For example, in the, the conference in the Buddhist temple now, our Khmer Buddhist temple now has to speak in Vietnamese, and those things make me really concerned, right? Because the the way we practice our religion is like is unique in in our uh, in our community, and now with the the the, the, the control of the government. They make our people practice our religion in fear because the way the government, they tell you what to do and it's not the way we practice uh, the, our, our religion. So um, make me think like, you know, it's like, for example, now when, when they, when they try to uh, um, uh, not recognize the Buddhist monk, the, the head monk as the Buddhist monk, and because of that, you can see like as a Buddhist monk, unless you violate any Buddhist rule. Then you can say he's not Buddhist monk. But now the government even control of Vietnam Buddhist Sangha comes to Al Khmer Buddhist Temple and claim that he's not recognized as the Buddhist monk. And because, and not just that in the temple, another and in another province, they do the same thing to another Buddhist monk, and we don't know that when they're going to arrest and defraud that monk, right? Because when the government has that much control over the way you practice your religion, that means they can tell you are Buddhist monk or not. It, it's not about like the Buddhist monk violate the Buddhist rule or not. Yeah, and we, that make us feel like, you know, it's the way we practice our religion now is like has a control, has a, the government put too deep the hand into the, in our, into our, our tradition. So for us over here, that's the only, for us over here, we can go out and, you know, ask for help and then you know, advocate for their right. But the people back home, they cannot do it. That motivate us, you know, if we don't speak for them, who will? So that's why we, uh, as an, um, I'm volunteer for the the Khmer Federation, and that's the only organization can bring our people voice to the world. Right? Yeah, thank for all your help too, right? Because that that is um, if without our work over here, the Khmer um, will have no voice back home. And I really thank you for bringing up the important issue of separation of church and state. And then, as we're here in New York City, and Roosevelt Island is just over there, it's that freedom from fear that you're talking about, that freedom from want freedom of speech. And of course, the other four freedoms is freedom of worship. And that's why this issue is so important. And you could see the interconnection. So T, can you share with me what first inspired you to care about these issues? And what were some of the campaigns you became first involved with? Um, so I guess the, just kind of going back to kind of finding yourself and I encourage all the youth who are maybe kind of seeking where there are, I think it's you, you face like a very different type of struggle when you are living abroad. Um, and so I think, uh, it really starts with you asking your parents, doing research back in the day, we didn't have a lot of things on Khmer Krom, but now if you Google Khmer Krom, a lot comes up. So you can do your own research and figure out, you know, kind of who you are, go visit back home. So definitely my father was one of my first inspiration. Um, he was someone that told me the history and then just hopping on the internet and figuring out the, the Federation back then had a Khmer Krom network. Um, and then connecting with Khmer Krom people um, through the internet, through Yahoo, and finding a community that I didn't know existed, and then learning about the struggle of our people. And I really remember really the first time um, that it happened was during in 2007. And we were actually, Joshua, if you remember, we were in Cambodia in Phnom Penh, and I heard, oh, our monks were protesting in Cambodia Krom. And, uh, and so we were like, what, what, what's happening? And we just didn't realize the amount of crackdown that was going to happen, um, against our people. Like there was, um, uh, monks that were defrosted, fled, and then there were monks that were imprisoned. Um, so that was the first time in a long time that our monks actually stood up, uh, actually organized uh, peacefully and stood up, um, demanding religious freedom or to be defrosted, disrespected, and then, um, imprisoned. And so, um, you know, we, we organized a global, uh, protest. We went to, you know, the, the Australian embassy, the, the, the American embassy, we went to the UN, we did whatever we could in order to bring the voice 
uh, forward. And this continues to be really important now because uh, the, the 13 people and monks who are detained really needs us uh, to step out our game and really try to help them because back then, um, you know, we really just had monks doing it. Now we have, um, we have youth, we have monks, we have women. And it's a different type of movement in the sense that because of our advocacy work here abroad, our people are learning a little more about their rights, right? Because with the use, the, with the internet, there's a greater awareness of, um, of them knowing um, in the, the work of the Federation and our work at the UN. They realize, though, hey, actually, you know, I, I can have these rights. I can exercise it. it. You know, it's something that's recognized by the United Nations international law. And so they're learning about it, and now they're, they're standing up for it, right? And now we are now starting to see the consequences of just, you know, just trying to exercise and being recognized. And now we really um, continue, and we hope to continue to campaign. We, you know, we have our protest tomorrow, um, and we'll be here at the United Nations for two weeks to c continue in awareness. Thank you so much, Zoti. And very powerful to give those examples of seeing people in the homeland organizing, connecting at the community level, in the capitals, and then, of course, at the Global Civil Society here at the UN. And it's true, there will be a protest in front of the United Nations at the Dog Hammer School Plaza. And that is just one way of using direct action, but also the diplomacy. And Connie, if you could share with us, what first inspired you to be involved on these important issues of human rights and some of the campaigns that you were able to cut your teeth on and be able to make a difference? Say that I was involved or I was rather interested in what my background was uh, when I spoke with many of my friends or people that were also involved in why uh, we realized that there was a lot of um, cultural differences. I did not know what those cultural differences was until we got to um, speaking about our languages, having these conversations, and uh, learning a little bit of our histories. Um, as a Kamakram or Kamakram uh, people, we do things very different. And that's where I've learned that uh, we are indigenous peoples, especially um, in the way that we care and um, we care about Mother Earth, how we um, deal with uh, our handling on uh, um, sacred sites, and again, um, how we then uh, speak to our elders or speak to uh, our Buddhist monks, there's certain ways in which we communicate with one another as well. That is quite different um, from uh, what I know about Cambodians or Vietnamese, those that um, also are around all, um, or geographically around uh, what is Kampuja uh, Kram. And as growing older, being involved with um, learning a little bit more about um, Macron history, uh, dealing with the present, unfortunately, with uh, past history of uh, many of our monks um, being uh, not only discriminated, but uh, incriminated, uh, learned uh, what are ways that we can raise our voices. And so at a young age, I would attend um, these um, Buddhist temples where uh, they would have conversations, uh, the elders, as well as um, other youths on what are ways that we can raise our voices. And so um, at a young age, uh, I am quite familiar with um, getting up early in the morning, taking uh, a bus that we all collectively um, put money into, um, going to D.C., going to locations where uh, we are protesting against uh, the constant human violations that are against our peoples. And so uh, with that, uh, learned more, especially through um, Kampuche, uh, my Kampuche Kram Federation and with the people that I work, uh, we come from different walks of life uh, where our expertise are in health or in business or um, in finance law. And so with us collectively coming from different walks of life and uh, reconnecting uh, with our indigenous groups, uh, that's where my foundation is from. Definitely, it's an exciting example in a way of really rights and role lifestyle of uh, liberation, but also rooted in love for one's people, but also for the entire planet. And I think that's what's so inspirational to see everyone here, not just be concerned and focus on having a job, but knowing that this is really a joy to be able to speak on behalf 
of one's people and to make sure that the world is a better place and making those connections. And as you described, that indigenous philosophy, that indigenous cosmology, it's also one to challenge the current tides, as the vice president of Bolivia was talking about, and swim against those currents to make sure that the world can be a better place for all as we find ourselves facing multiple crises. Moni, as we're here, we really know that indigenous people's basic practice of heritage are constantly being criminalized and even been declared terrorists for only living out the articles of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as well as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Can you share with us a bit a vision for the future of these rights and potential path to respect, protect, fulfill the rights on the ground and uh, around the globe? Yeah, for, for us, right, as in this people of the Mekong Delta, um, we we want to have a basic right. And right now, you know, the right to have right, our people don't even have it. So to, to envision that the right of, you know, as in China, in the UN trip, it's like, that's what we want to do. And we want really want to train our people back home about their right, like as, as a team mentioned, right? Because we got our world over here, our people back home now start learning about their right. And especially uh, just to try to distribute the UN, UN trip, our people already got arrested and imprisoned. Imagine uh, what right do they have over there? And as for us and activists, we try to advocate and then try to uh, remotely, because in Vietnam, there's no NGO can freely operate in Vietnam. So the only thing we can do if we try to remotely educate our people about their rights, right? Try to uh, translate our uh, UN trip to our language so our people can bring and can distribute. And unfortunately, just by doing that, the government arrests and imprison them. So I really hope that, you know, as these people around the world, when they enjoy their right, as in these people, you know, have to look back and help out the people who have no voice, right? So we can come together and raise it, just the right to recognize as in these people, our people back home that we will inherit. So, um, so this is why the work at the, the, our team go to the UN PFI is really important because to show the world, to show the, 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 the member state to, to become out with a, a, a procedure to help out the people who have no right to recognize as these people, right? To make it a, a, a step to force, I mean, a step to ask the government, uh, a basic step to ask the government, the member state that does not recognize these people to do something, right? So that the people who can uh, exercise the right as they do not uh, fail impeachment, just our people back home. Thank you so much, Moni. And turning to you, Soti, maybe you can share a bit your vision for the future of these rights, but also your first experience here at the UN. I know you came here at a very young age and gave a speech at the Permanent Forum. And what did that feel like and what was the response and how did that set you on your path to make a difference for democracy and human rights for Khmer Crown people? Um, so talking first quickly on the vision, um, I think, uh, you know, I, we just want our people to be recognized and be respected. And I hope that, you know, one day we can, you know, have street sign that the Reina Gaul, which is now Ho Chi Minh, uh, you know, Saigon. And that our people will have the right, the land uh, that they're, you know, recognized. Um, and really just to, to live with, in peace with dignity, dignity and, um, you know, uh, that recognized as um, uh, indigenous people. Um, speaking, like, you know, I came in, it's almost 20 years now, actually, for Moni, it's 20 years. For me, it's 19 years since I uh, attended the Permanent Farm on Indigenous Issues. Um, I remember yeah, meeting you, Joshua, and you telling me to, to do a speech right there and then coming all the way from the, the United States. Um, you did the speech, it made a great impact. Um, I never knew uh, the world that I was about to encounter, but it really changed my life and found my place um, in kind of our, our micro community. I love that we have an opportunity to make a global impact um, and make a difference um, to the people, like the, like the, the people that are not like just any people. It is, you know, it is our ancestors, it is our parents, it's my aunt and uncle who still live in the land. And so we have such great power that we can potentially do. And in some ways, it seems so easy, like just to go to the UN, to, to write a speech, to give a speech. Uh, it really pales in comparison to the people that are at, you know, at the front lines, right? You know, you're talking about Dan Win Hong and our monks. For example, they're like being courageous and they're like, you know, now in prison 
And what we do is so easy and it pales, but it is a struggle. It, it takes a lot of us. It takes a lot of energy. Um, there's, there's a lot of sacrifice, but what I'm trying to say is it, in some ways it does pale because if we were asked to do the, the same things that they did, could we do it? You know, so I'm really grateful um, to meet the people I have encountered over the last 19 years. Um, I'm really honored and privileged, and I hope to continue this work um, moving forward. Well, hello, thank you, so T. And it's true, it's it's the 23rd session of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, and it's 20th anniversary that Khmer Krom people have come to the UN to be able to speak and share the story and the struggles for self-determination. And as we look at that, Connie, could you maybe share and give a recap of what's happening this week at the Permanent Forum? We know there are a couple of agenda items, but like the Khmer Krom Federation has actually spoken numerous times. Can you share with us the message that has been shared with the world? So what is particularly special about this uh, session, or the 23rd session here at the UNPFII, is that there is a lot of emphasis on uh, the youth and the impact that the youth has um, done to continue to carry the torch, especially for the elders. And in regards to the items that we have spoken on, uh, we have thankfully presented um, on not only uh, financing for Indigenous peoples, but also um, we discussed the six banded areas of the pound of corn, which would be culture, environment, education, and health. And so when we talk about these issues, we do d definitely bring up the fact that we are Indigenous and they're uh, that like many other Indigenous peoples in the Asia region, um, our member state um, does not recognize us as Indigenous peoples. Uh, so we continue to emphasize this time and time and again. However, uh, with this year, uh, we are working towards uh, looking at other ways that we can uh, enhance our voice or our participation uh, at the forum. So whether that is um, social net networking with other people, with um, connecting with the other youths and other um, indigenous organizations, that's raising our voice, that's spreading um, out who we are as a peoples. And when it comes to issues uh, such as one of our youths, such as one of our youths being, uh, not being able to uh, go to the forum um, for whatever reason, uh, we were able to uh, get him in uh, through uh, the youth caucus uh, where uh, it resonated with many others that were there uh, that had noted that they too were having issues with getting through. And so um, instead of being disenfranchised, we found alternative ways to um, get the work done. Mahalo, thank you so much, all of you, for the work that you've done for decades, uh, but also coming and sharing that story. We are here at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, discussing many of the articles of the UDHR, specific Article 11, and pointing out that these basic rights that maybe are seen as luxuries are actually absolutely essential for all aspects of life. We thank you for tuning in to Cooper Union and appreciate all of the actions that people are doing as we exercise this most basic right of freedom of media, speech, and assembly. Thank you so much. Malavia Mikapono, and we'll see you next week. to announce that Think Tech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.